I, I was very encouraged as the choir started singing and I started listening to the wordings of the song. Because the theme and the talk I have for us today is titled, The Gospel of Power. The Gospel of Power. And I don't know whether you can put a name to the gospel that you preach. But I want to say to you that the gospel that Jesus gave to us, the gospel that has been introduced to us to preach, and in this whole month, and even last month, we've been talking about sharing our faith with people that we come in contact with. And I want to remind us today that the gospel that God has given to us to take to the world out there is a gospel that is full of the power of God. Amen? Amen? My prayer today is that as you listen to me, even as you listen to me, but certainly by the end of this word, the power of God will hit you wherever you are sat. In the mighty name of Jesus. The gospel of Jesus is a gospel of power. The word gospel is derived from an Anglo-Saxon term that is called Godspell. Godspell. Meaning good story. So it's just meant to be a good story. The Latin word evangelium and the Greek word evangelion. One is evangelium, Latin. One is evangelion, that is Greek. They both translate good news, which is, in fact, could be said to be the telling of the good story. So the telling of the good story is naturally going to be a variable enterprise. If all of us here were to give an account of what happens in church today, you're going to have a thousand and one opinion as to how and what happened. Isn't it? Because it will reflect our perception. It will reflect everything that is different about us. In the same way, reporting an event by different people will reflect different understanding, different perception, different expectation, and a different character of the people who are reporting it. The more people who are reporting on a given account of the same event, the more you find out and you should expect variable accounts of the event. Classic about what I'm talking about today are the four Gospels in the Bible. The Gospel of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. All these writers were disciples of Jesus. They went everywhere with him. They were taught by him. They followed him everywhere that he went. And probably they saw all the events and the things that happened around Jesus all at the same time. However, their accounts and their witness statements are totally and completely different. You should expect that. Because they were all different people. Their career were different. Do you know, the way you give an account of something will be different from the account of another person. I'll probably share this testimony uh, on this Super Sunday of something that happened between myself. I mean, something that had been bothering me and had been weighing me down. And one day I gave it to my son to read, with the grace of God, a lawyer. And he read it. I said, oh, Dad, this is biscuit. I said, wow, what do you mean? Anyway, to cut the long story short, sorted. I get what I'm saying. Because he read it differently from the way I've been reading it. And the whole thing was sorted out. 
Don't forget, it's been troubling me. But then somebody just read it. He didn't pray. And it was sorted out. He didn't pray. He didn't have to pray. What am I talking about this morning? Matthew, in his own account, wanted to use his Jewish mindset to convince Palestinians who were Jews. He was trying to convince them that the Jesus, the Messiah that we have found, is the promised Messiah that was given to us. The covenant of a Messiah coming is actually arrived because the Palestinian Jews didn't believe it. So his own account was to prove it. It's like a scientist trying to prove to them that I found the genuine one. Mark, on his own account, was a bit of a motivational, action packed sermon. He was there to motivate the people and call them to action, to say, let us do anything that we can do to show that we believe this God. Motivational. He wanted the people to take a faith action. So he didn't tell them so much. He told them just enough to get them to act. That's why it's about one of the briefest of the, script, of the, of the Gospels. When you go to Luke, Luke was the educated one. He was, the, he was a doctor, medical doctor. He knew the precept of things. He followed principles. He knew that he had to do things according to how it's been stated. So Luke took his time. He's educated his illustrious mind to present the principle and a detailed account that will reach the sophisticated and perhaps those who were backsliding away because they didn't just understand the fact that this whole thing has to be logical. If it's not logical, you, you, you can't tell me that he just prayed and then healing just happened. You need to tell me more. I need to know what is in there. That's why Luke took time to go into details of things. John, in his own account, he, wrote, he didn't write to the unbelievers. He wrote to those who have been turned believers, who are now in church. He, he wrote to strengthen their faith. He wrote to strengthen the mind of believers. That I know you are now born again and you are going through issues. You are still experiencing what was promised to you that you will not see anymore. But you know what? Hold on. Hold on there. He told us more about what we need to know about Jesus. He told the people about the validity and the pride of their faith in Christ Jesus. Regardless of their opposition. Regardless of the challenges they were going through, he doesn't want them to lose the fact that you have been saved. And you must hold on to that faith in Christ Jesus. In the same way, this morning, my message is to tell you and to give a confirmation of the scripture in 2 Corinthians 3 verse 2 to 6. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 2 to 6. It says, The only letter of recommendation we need is you yourself. Your lives are a letter written in our hearts. Everyone can read it and recognize our good work among you. Clearly, you are the letter from Christ, showing the results of our ministry amongst you. This letter is written not with pen and ink, but with the spirit of the living God. It is carved not on tablets of stones, but on human hearts. Verse 4 says, we are confident 
of all these because our great trust in God through Christ. It is not that we think we are qualified to do anything of our own. Our qualification comes from God. Verse 6 says, He has enabled us to be ministers in, of his own covenant, of his new covenant. This is a covenant not written laws, but of the spirit of, of the spirit. The old written covenant end in death, but under the new covenant, the spirit gives life. Somebody say amen. amen. That is what I want to prove to you. That's what I want to direct your heart towards. That you're not just living life. You're not just born again. You're not just a Christian. You are rewriting the Bible. Your life is actually the gospel. There are people today who will never read the Bible. But guess what they will read? They will read your life. They will read the gospel according to Vanessa. They will read the gospel according to Godwin. They will read the gospel according to Tunde. They will read the gospel according to whosoever and whatsoever you are called. You are going to be the gospel that they read. And what we are saying, what I'm saying to you is that what perceptive, what name would they call your gospel? What name would they call your gospel? Each of us, our lives are gospels for people to read. And if, uh, if you care to know, people are already reading the gospel of your account. Either you like it or yes. The same way that we read St. Matthew's gospel, people are reading the St. Matthew gospel of, I mean, the, the gospel of your own life. You know, the gospel of Tunebalogu is very interesting to read. There's some things that you are not going to miss reading in my life. Because it's very obvious. What are the obvious things about your life that is going to obviously be in your gospel? What name do people call your gospel? You know, people who knew me from school, when I was in school, then I wrote a gospel called Don Balogzi because that was what they called me. But I thank God because my gospel has changed. I now... I'm presenting and I've written, I've rewritten the gospel of my life because it's a gospel of a transformed man. A transformed man by the gospel of Jesus. I want to say to you, do not bother about the gospel that you wrote before now. Don't bother about the gospel you wrote before Jesus came in contact with you. What I challenge you to bother about is the gospel that you are reading or you are writing after Jesus and the blood of Jesus changed your life. 2 Peter 1.10 says that we should make our calling and election sure. What God has called us to be. There's no need. It's of no purpose if you're not going to be a Christian to call yourself a Christian. You know, the believers in the Bible, they actually call themselves Christians. There was nothing like that in the Bible to say Christians. They say believers. It was people who saw them, people who saw the way they were acting, that said, oh, these people look like Christians. And by Christians, they mean the people who have been with Christ. If you are Christian, you won't call yourself a Christian. There's nothing like a good Christian. No, speak it away. A Christian must be a Christian. A believer must be a believer. There's nothing like a good believer or a bad believer. It's either you are on ground or you are not on ground. There's no sitting on the fence. It is for you to make up your mind what you are going to be called. 
Your gospel matter. And it must matter to you who people around you and who God Almighty know you to be. Jesus wanted to know this because it's important. It's not good for you alone to know what you should be called or what you want to be called. Jesus wanted to know what people call him. So in Mark chapter 8 from verse 27 to 29, he called his guys after a few months or maybe one year or so. He said, guys, what do people call me actually? When you go around and talking to people, what do they say that I am? Oh, they start giving all the opinions. Say, some say you are John the Baptist. Some say you are Elijah. And others say you are one of those other prophets that we didn't write their name, that their names are not so important. Guess what Jesus said? Jesus now zero into them. He said, but who do you say that I am? You're married. Who will your spouse say you are? Your sons and daughters, who will they say you are? Oh, your colleague at work. That one. Yeah, that one. That sit beside you. Who would they say you are? Your neighbor. Who would they say you are? Because Jesus zeroed in on them. Forget what other people are saying. But you guys are the closest to me. Who do you say that I am. Only one of them had a measure of understanding. Peter said in verse 29, so then he asked them, but who do you say I am? Peter replied, you are the Messiah. But Jesus warned them not to tell any other person. You know why? Other guys don't yet know. Because at that point in time, there were some things, there were some deep things that he wanted to tell them. He couldn't tell them until they were matured to the point of handling them. That's why there are some things you can't tell children. I mean, there are some things you cannot give to children to handle. I see people who are going to buy iPhone for their three-year-old. You will destroy that child. You will destroy that child. It's part of those things that they cannot handle. They can use it. Oh, yes. That's all they do. And they can, I mean, some children know more passwords that, than I know. And I know a little bit. I, I mean, I'm, I'm a mature compared to some people. Some people know passwords. But there are some children, the brain is so woven and been exposed to so much. Hey, hey, slow down. Calm them down. The world is changing. Yes, we know. But we must not change recklessly with the world. Because the world that is changing is very deceptive. Completely deceptive. You need to let God give you an understanding of what it is, the times that we are in and what he expects of us. That's the hallmark of being a Christian. Peter got it right and gave the solution. At this point, Jesus was convinced by Peter's witness that the people, that is the disciples, now know that he is the Messiah. So at that point, he started talking to them about, that was the first time he made up his mind he would tell them that he was going to be killed and the next three days, he will raise up and take his life back. 
They could handle it at that point. Before then, he never told them. So he said, keep it secret because those guys can't handle it yet. Our gospel translates into the epistles of our lives. What are epistles? Epistles are the letters that we write about our experiences of the gospel of Jesus that we have experienced and we write it to people in faraway land. There are some places you will never go. There are some places I will never get to in life. But they can hear about your life and your experience through the gospel. Thank God for technology. Thank God for the internet. Thank God for everything that we now see around us today. That's why it's not, not everything about the internet is bad. Actually, Pastor, Pastor Wally asked me a question two weeks ago. I think it was myself and one of the other pastors. He said, have you ever thought about it? If something went wrong with the internet today, have you thought about it before? If the kind of thing that happened to Ebola, like, like that happens like Ebola, or all these viruses hit the internet and it paralyzes, what will happen to you? Because some of us, we, we don't live on ground anymore. Some of us don't live on ground. We now live on the internet. This is how you walk around. You walk, you walk around like ghosts. People don't see you. All your friends are on the internet. Everybody you talk to, they are. you never see them and you never see them. You see how many friends you have? I say, I have 20,000 friends. Where? No one. Any friend that you don't have a tangible relationship with, they're not your friends. They're acquaintances. I want to tell you, live a realistic life with God. Some people are playing on the internet. Some people are making money on the internet. Which one are you doing? Some people are building their career on the internet. Some people are destroying it on the internet. Which one is yours? People are doing tangible, people are running businesses on the internet. Multi-million dollar corporations on the internet. What are you doing? Just sharing images that are not genuine, that are not real. Not real. Last week I told you that if you want to get a job that they don't need a referee from anybody, just go, just, just go to your, to your um, DP or whatever it is and just check you out. By the time they merge two of them, they can bring a dozier of who you are. Check it well. Some people actually go on the internet to get married. The person they will live the rest of their lives with, they pluck it from the internet. If you pluck it like that, without any understanding of the fact that you need to know that you know, that you know. One day, what you pluck, you might find out that is, is not exactly what you thought. Do you know, if you see a, 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 an orange on the tree that looks so ripe, until you get it and feel it, if you can check that this one is real orange, some of them can be, well, I don't know what word. They can be Sakam and Jays. <laughs> Terrible things that you touch them, you will just dissolve. You've got to know the real life experience of what you want to rely your life on. Peter was unaware. Don't forget, Peter had revelation. He passed. But Peter was unaware of how to totally surrender to the power of God that he has found in Christ Jesus. Are you getting me? 
Because if you read further on in Mark 14, Mark chapter 14, the same Peter that God writes the messianic nature of the Son of God, when Jesus told him that, you know what, in a few hours they're going to deny me, he said, over my dead body. He predicted to him that I can see a turbulent future. I can see you guys running the altar skelter. Instead of him to say, Jesus, help me. What is it that I can do? He said, even if all these guys, all these guys, even if they deny you, not me, Peter, the rock. Can you see how pride can finish somebody? Because he has just seen one revelation, or one revelation. He became a tough guy. His steps changed. Nobody could tell him anymore. You can't even seek his opinion. He, he, he rubbished all the other guys. Look at it. He wrote it. I mean, he said... In verse 29, Mark 14, 29, said, Peter said to him, even if everyone else deserts you, I never will. With every affirmation. For Jesus to have seen it, he should have known that there's something the Son of God could see that he could not see. He could have humbled himself and said, Master, Oh, it would never have been my will to do this. Help me. Have mercy upon me. He boasted. Jesus replied to him in verse 30, I tell you the truth, Peter. This very night, not tomorrow, this same night, before the rooster crow, twice, you will deny three times. Not once. Three consecutive times that you even know me. <laughs> you will even say you never knew me at all. Far from it. And if you have watched the movie, I, I love that side. He said, if that guy was Nigerian, I have never seen him before in my whole life. In my entire whole life. That's what you say. And some other countries will even say it worse. Americans? Americans will tell you, I know no one, man. There are some countries they will ask, they will tell you back as if they didn't hear what you said. What, what did he say? Know who? Know who? People with different ways of life. Jesus was warning him to prepare, but he did not listen. Peter was stuck to his old way of getting by with things in his own power, not yielding to God's power. Today, I want to challenge you. Enough of your power leading you through life. Enough of depending on your abilities. Enough of depending on your intellect. Enough of depending on your wisdom. On your talent. Enough of thinking you can go by and round with everything you can do. And I know some of us are very smart. Oh, I've seen smart people. I know people who can, they can, here they can tell you what Tunde Balogun would do, the three next thing I would do after I step, out, step down of this pulpit to preach. They can tell you. They've so studied me, they can tell you. They are so smart, they can tell you five things that will happen tomorrow. Just by understanding. But I tell you, they use that thing to smite themselves. Because they now know too much. And no more room for God. Very quickly, 
if you want to experience the gospel of power, number one, make sure your gospel is true. Let your life be true. Know all those shady deals with the things of God. There are many people using God now than allowing God to use them. Your gospel must be true. Your gospel must be complementary. Number two, complementary gospel. Even though they are four gospel, they didn't contradict themselves. They woven into each other. The four of them is a complete gospel. The four gospel of, 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 of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Number three, it must be central on the person of Jesus, not on you, the messenger. You hear some people preach. You are even trying to find out where Jesus is in the message. Because they are only talking about themselves. Themselves. What they had done. What they are doing. What they are planning to do. And wh- how they are going to do it. Oh, sorry. That is not the gospel of Jesus. The gospel of Jesus must have the centrality of his person. Number four. If your gospel must be the gospel of power, it must carry the message that Jesus brought from heaven. Not the message that is filled with the principle of management. They are good. Don't get me wrong. They are very good. But you must find out about the spirit of the principle. Because all those principles were derived from the Bible. I can tell you that. But some of us run off with the principles and forget to go to God who was the original person that gave the principle. Number five, if your gospel must be the gospel of power, it must reveal the power of God and how to encounter that power. I've read the Bible. How can I be healed from it? Yeah. I've read the Bible. How can I get wisdom from it? Yeah. I've read the Bible. How can I love an unlovable person from it? Yes. I've read the Bible. How can I raise up my children in that gospel? Yes. You must be able to find out all this. Because if you don't find it out, all you have done is just get knowledge. Knowledge. Knowledge can kill. And knowledge gets obsolete. The textbooks that we use in school, if some children read it today, it will be like Latin. Because everything has changed. There's like 10 other editions that have happened after then. Praise God. How many of you want to experience the power of God today? All I'm going to do is read these five verses of scripture to you. And I will give them to you to take home. The reading of the word of God brings power. Amen? And the power of God will come upon you as you are sat. Number one, Romans 1.16. Romans 1.16. Say, for I am not ashamed of this good news about Christ. It is the power of God at work. Saving everyone who believes, the Jews first and also the Gentiles. That power of God is available to touch you and be at work in you, even as you are hearing me this morning in Jesus' name. The second scripture is 1 Corinthians 1.18. 1 Corinthians 1.18 says, The message of the cross is foolish to those who are headed for destruction. But we are being saved but we are so, so, but we who are being saved I beg your pardon but we who are being saved know it is the very power of God. Amen? The gospel is the power of God. Is the energy of God. Number three. 
I love this. Luke 1, 69. He has sent us a mighty Savior. He didn't send us someone elementary, somebody immature. He has sent us a mighty Savior from the royal line of his servant David. Jesus is mighty. That's what makes him Savior. Number four, 1 Corinthians 4.20 For the kingdom of God is not just a lot of talk. It's not blabbing. The kingdom of God, the gospel of the Jesus that we preach is not of a lot of talk. It is living by God's power. And I pray that from today, you will live in the power of God. In the mighty name of Jesus. Number five. I actually had six here. So you have an extra one. Number five. It says in 1 Thessalonians 1 verse 5. For when we brought you the good news, it was not only with words, but also with power. For the Holy Spirit gave you full assurance that what we said was true. As you are sat there listening to me, I presume that something the Holy Spirit is telling you that this is the true gospel. This is what you need for the solution of what the future holds, of that business deal, of that person that is so difficult. Lastly, 1 Corinthians 2, 4. And my message and my preaching were very plain. Rather, using clever and persuasive speech or speeches, I rely only on the power of the Holy Spirit. Everything I've said to you today, I have said according to God has given me utterance. But I release it into God's hands and the Holy Spirit to walk in your heart and use this to transform your future in the mighty name of Jesus. We're just going to take the communion and my prayer is that as we take this communion, indeed, you will see the witness and the confirmation in your heart, in your life, in your being, that God is kind and God is faithful. Father God, we commit this communion emblems onto your hands. Together with those who are on the digital platforms, we ask of you to bless these emblems. As we partake in this communion, Father, we ask that you dine with us. The same covenant that you left with us 2,021 years ago when you allow for your son to be crucified for us. Father God, we register our partnership and our faith in that covenant. Father God, let life come to us. In the mighty name of Jesus. Every assurance that we need of tomorrow, Father God, we receive today. In the mighty name of Jesus. Let there be the power of the Holy Ghost that comes from the gospel of Jesus to evade every part of our being and liberate us, O God, for a life of continuity in Christ Jesus. Father God, we thank you. We bless your name. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. Amen. Please, as you take one of the emblems with those of us who are at home, I don't know what, whether you require healing in your body, whether you require wisdom. Whatever the power of God can attend to in your life, 
I want you to be very focused because I know very sincerely in my spirit that God's power is already all over you where you are sat. God will bring a transformation. God will bring a healing. God is already working in you to change difficult situation into something simple. God is already saying to you that he wants to bring about a tomorrow that is secured in Christ Jesus. God is already saying to you that you should be left in no doubt that favor is on your side. Father God, we thank you today. We bless you. We honor you, O oh God. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. If you have, I'd like to ask you to please open the first part of the emblem that stands for the body of Jesus. That same body that was hung on the tree. Was hung on the tree so that we can be released and be set free. And so today, I ask that you are set free from every burden that has weighed you down in the mighty name of Jesus. Every discomfort that the world has thrown at you, today I decree that they melt away in the mighty name of Jesus. Father God, we thank you today. We bless you in Jesus' mighty name. Receive the body of Jesus in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. In the same way, his blood was drained out of him as a price, the ultimate price. Today, I ask and I pray, according to the word of God, I decree that the word of God, even the power therein, will bring you life. Because the price has been paid, I decree that you are set free from every stoppage, from every hindrance, in the mighty name of Jesus. Receive your freedom and your liberty in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Yes, we thank you, O Lord. We praise you. We acknowledge that you are God and you are king. In Jesus' 